I know you're promoting two different books. Yeah. <laughs> and I assume your personal life has been kind enough to completely go on pause while that's happening. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's what happens, right? Like. <laughs> No one other than your publicist needs you for anything. Yeah, no, man. I'm homeschooled, so I uh, this has just been this has been an adventure. You're homeschooling the whole time you're doing this. Yep. Yes, I am. Yep. How old are if you don't mind me asking? How old are your kids? I just have one. He's 13 now. Uh, I wrote this book for him actually when he was 11. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, yeah. So he's he's a fun age to homeschool because he. You know, he likes to learn stuff on his own. And basically, when I was a kid, all I wanted was to be homeschooled. And my mom was like, no, because she had three kids and she wanted us out of her hair all day, I assume. Uh, so I was like, if I ever have a kid, I'm going to homeschool him if he wants to be homeschooled or homeschool them if they want to be homeschooled. And it turned out that he loved public school for about five years and then he decided he didn't like it anymore. And so I pulled him in the middle of the school year two years ago. And we've been homeschooling since, which means I have had no time to write anything. <laughs> well, you were ahead of the pandemic, though, I assume. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I was able to make the choice to homeschool him, which was nice. And I had like, these two books that were being shopped around at the time. And I was hoping that like, if I got at least a good home for one of them, then my career wouldn't just completely die while I was homeschooling forever. And it turns out they both got good homes. So I was very lucky. Oh, that's fantastic. Cool. I mean, you're a full-time writer now, right? Full-time writer slash homeschool teacher mm -hmm. slash yep. mom slash all the 50 other hats we're all wearing. Yep. Um, were, I mean, did you have plans to continue maintaining some sort of day job or was the plan always to go toward being an author? I've, I've wanted to be an author since forever. I, uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be all kinds of different things. I wanted to be a paleontologist for a long time. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to do like all these things that kind of require a lot more like focus and dedication and decisiveness. And then I realized at one point, I was probably about 10, that if I was an author, then I could just kind of dabble in all the things that I'm interested in and kind of live vicariously through characters. And then that's just that's always been what's been most appealing to me is to just be able to mess around and learn about everything and do crazy research and just have fun. And so, yeah, I've wanted to be a writer for ever, really. What's your, uh, you know, we should call this the start of the show because this is already good stuff. Uh, what's your, what's your first memory of wanting to be an author? Oh man. I don't know. I always, I've always loved books. Like I, I was the, my mom's firstborn kid and I didn't really have to, like share stuff with anybody so I was reading all the time and nobody took my books from me it was great and so I uh basically learned how to read when I was two and just have been reading non-stop ever since and I always like I said from when I was about 10 I knew I wanted to write but then when I was about 12 my dad brought back from a, a, a used bookstore a couple of copies of the um the Year's Best Fantasy and Horror Anthologies by uh, Ellen Datlow and Terry Windling, and just handed them to me without looking through them or vetting them in any way to see if they were remotely appropriate for a 12-year-old. And uh, <laughs> so I read those and they just blew my mind. I mean, not only was there just a lot more, you know, adult content than I was used to reading, um, but those were what let me know what I wanted to write, that I wanted to write speculative fiction. And, um, and I just went and found all the rest of those and went through my dad's. My dad had an, an old, like, golden age science fiction collection, like Bester and Heinlein and all those guys and Asimov. And I read through, like, this entire closet shelf of books. And it was just amazing. Like, when I was in, in fourth grade, we had to do, a like, a Prove You Reddit diorama book report. And... I did mine on The Stars My Destination by Alfred Bester in Lego. And uh, my teacher had no idea what book that was. And it was okay because I, I enjoyed it. So I've always I've always been like into, into science fiction and fantasy. And so that was kind of a no brainer for me that that's, that's what I wanted to write. And I started seriously trying to publish when I was like 13, 14 years old, like back in the day when you'd have to like get a self-addressed stamped envelope and send it out and get the guidelines back in the mail. and I had like, like my copy of Writer's Market and my stack of self-addressed stamped envelopes. And 
I was actually getting personalized rejections from pro markets when I was 13. And that was just beginner's luck, just absolute beginner's luck. And it's, I still don't know why that happened. It shouldn't have happened. your furry letter. I am 13. And it's no, I didn't. You should I really didn't encourage me. <laughs> no, I didn't. I was like, and I didn't even know at the time that it was like, I was just bummed because I was getting rejections and then I kept them. And I went back and looked at them like in my early 20s. I was like, oh my God, those are personalized rejections. <laughs> <laughs> Were you still getting those in your 20s? Were Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes my beginner's luck had worn off by then. <laughs> right. Hi there, esteemed audience. Uh, my guest is uh, Nicole Cornerstace. I'm saying that right? Mm -hmm. uh, author of Jillian versus Parasite Planet, um, which is available July. <laughs> in in, in mid-July of, of 2021, we were discussing before, we think, we think possibly July 20th, but it sounds like it's a little bit in flux. But, you know, check, check, check her website. It's probably available right now. <laughs> it's available for pre-order right now. That is true. Oh, perfect. But, yeah, but in terms of actual release date, it's anywhere between the 13th and the 20th, depending on who I ask. Is that uh, cost stress at all, or is it just par for the course? For, I mean, it's par for the course, honestly. I mean, I've been so busy promoting my adult novel that just came out that I'm just like, it's, this is completely snuck up on me. I was like, oh, I've got to start doing promotion for, for Jillian now. Um, but I've definitely had before where like I had my, the first book of mine that, that anyone's ever heard of, which is not even actually my first book is um, 2015, my YA debut Archivist Wasp. Um, that book was supposed to come out in May, but Amazon just kind of released it a month early for whatever reason and i didn't know until people were like hey my copy of your book showed up and i was like Amazon oh okay just, you know laterally did that without input from your I, I i guess i don't know um I, I i honestly don't know what happened um that publisher hates amazon for many excellent reasons and uh so i don't imagine they were really in communication with that much at all because i think they tried to like avoid amazon as much as possible um so that yeah, that was a surprise. Um, so this, I mean, the the fact that this is just like just like a week. I mean, everything's been weird. Like my my book that just came out in May, Firebreak, that was supposed to have come out last year, and so I was all prepared for it to come out last year. And then they had all kinds of issues as a publisher, and there's a pandemic, and it got pushed back. It was actually supposed to get pushed back until sort of around next week. Actually, it was supposed to come out, and then at one point um, they emailed me and they're like, Hey, how about May? yeah okay sure let's do it in may instead and so i'm I'm used to this all just being completely in flux honestly so a week difference does not bother me you must uh you just roll with the punches and it's uh you're just completely used to it at this point i mean i work in publishing man i have to <laughs> That sounds like it. I, and for the record, uh, we here at Middle Grade Ninja adore Amazon. We think they are the finest and greatest company ever. We hope they continue to list my books prominently. We think Jeff Bezos shouldn't pay taxes and put <laughs> that money to go to space. Why not? <laughs> um. So, okay, uh, you mentioned Heinlein, uh, and I saw that some reviewers have been uh, comparing Jillian versus Parasite Planet uh, to Heinlein for you know, the really obvious reason that there's a little bit of Starship Troopers going on with it. Yeah. Um, and uh, were you a Heinlein fan? You know, I actually, all that old school science fiction, I read it when I was a kid, and I never actually went back and reread any of it as an adult. But I'm sure that all of it just kind of has sort of taken root in my brain subconsciously, and it all it all kind of informs probably everything that I do. Of the, the the books that I read at that time, like when I was like in fourth grade, when they were like way too old for me, and I probably shouldn't have been reading them. The one that I remember liking the most was *The Stars My Destination* by Alfred Bester. Although thinking back on some things in that book, they're like wildly problematic, as like most of the books from that era probably are. They probably don't age very well. Um, but yeah, I really should go back and, and read some of that stuff and just see how much of it I can trace to like, oh yeah, this was formative for me. That was formative for me just because it, I read it at such, such an age that it was just really, that it would stick with me without me even really being aware of it, you know? 
Well, that's the thing I, I find about um, uh, having lived past a certain point, especially having been around at a time when there was no internet, there was mm-hmm. not the same collective culture that we've come to now. We, I mean, we still had television shows that tried to program us, but you could go places and they were less the same. There were less, um, you, the restaurants weren't all 100% identical. Mm-hmm. The mall didn't look like the same mall you left five states ago. Um, where was I going with that? Well, it, was, it was a beautiful description and a lead up, but it was, uh, oh, I've lost it. Uh, no, I was uh, talking about uh, problematic uh, literature. If you've lived long enough, anytime I talk about something I really loved when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I have to stop and go, wait a minute, I used to recommend Raw Dahl to everybody, and I know how that turned out. Yeah. Uh, certainly Heinlein, uh, I knew at the time I read it, like, whoa, that's not, that's not great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you should not have said that. Yeah. Uh, I think Asimov also. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, that was a nice uh, conversational cul-de-sac. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about Jillian versus the Parasite Planet and and talk about your career and everything we, we we can work in here. But esteemed audience knows I never summarize anyone else's book. Why would I make you? Uh, sit through me doing that and getting it wrong. So if you would, uh, tell the esteemed audience, what do they need to know about Jillian versus Parasite Planet to either be purchasing or pre-purchasing their copy? Oh, wow. Well, the way I write books is I tend to kind of mash a lot of things together. And uh, this is no exception. Uh, My agent, because she's an amazing agent, decided that the best way to summarize this book is to call it The Martian for Kids. And actually one of the the blurbers came up with that that same thing too. And I think it's, it's a good description. So it's basically, it's it's a survival story. I wrote it uh, with my son in mind. And he, he, at the time that I wrote this, he was 11. He was a very reluctant reader. And so I wanted to write something that he was going to find interesting to read. And he was really into survival stories, really into like outdoorsy stuff. And his favorite book at the time was Hatchet by Gary Paulson. And yeah, and and I wanted to write basically something like that, but in space. And so that's what this is. When I was pitching it, I was calling it Hatchet in Space. And then someone pointed out to me that that was wildly confusing because there's, I guess, a movie called Hatchet that's about an axe murderer. And that doesn't really go well with a kid's book. So uh, I'm going to go with The Martian for Kids. It makes more sense and is less confusing about axe murderiness. Um, but so Jillian is uh, she's 11 and she has anxiety. And one thing that was really important for me to do in this book was to depict a child with anxiety the way anxiety actually looks in children. Because in media, so often the shorthand for anxiety is like, oh, they're the shy kid, like they're, they're socially anxious. But my son has anxiety and it actually took me a really long time to get a diagnosis for him because I didn't really know what I was looking at because I grew up with stories and in all of the media depictions that I could see in fiction, like the anxiety, the anxious kid, the kid with anxiety was the shy one, was the you know introverted one who wasn't outgoing. And my kid is extremely outgoing, is extremely extroverted, also has severe anxiety. And so I wanted to depict that in fiction in a way that I had never actually seen it done before. But at the same time, I wanted it to be like just this this big fun adventure story. And so Jillian goes to space with her parents and uh, they they have this kind of portal based space travel. So they're ending up like on on planets that are like well well outside of our of our um our solar system. And they are their job is they're supposed to bring back resources for green tech here on Earth. And right now they're they're looking for this specific type of algae. And Jillian has always wanted to go to space with them, and she, they, she, you know, they've always said, "No, you can't. It's you know, we can't bring you to space. You're you're 11. This is this is a bad idea." But then they surprise her on "Take Your Kid to Work Day," which was my agent's idea. I said, "What was the what's the plausible reason why they would take her to space?" And she goes, "Well, it's Take Your Kid to Work Day, and was, you're a good agent, and I like you." <laughs> <laughs> Saved me there because I had no idea. So they take her to space, to this planet, where, which they have been to many, many times. They know it's safe. This is like a totally low risk environment. And of course, things go sideways. And Jillian ends up stuck there with uh, her parents are 
out of commission essentially. They're alive, they're just, uh, they're not helping right now. And so she's essentially on her own um, along with this kind of multi-tool space probe thing that they bring with them, which is uh, the semi-autonomous bio-reconnoitering intelligent nanobot array, Sabrina. And so Jillian and Sabrina basically have to, to figure out how to stay alive on this planet, which has turned out to be extremely hostile all of a sudden, um, and to keep Jillian's parents alive long enough to rendezvous with the portal when it comes back in a week. And uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a survival story in space is, is really the, the best way I can, I can describe it. I really like the Martian for Kids comparison. It's, it's, it's apt. Um, it is very science heavy. It, uh, it has a, a parasite that I got to invent the life cycle of, which is, that was fun. Um, Cross that one off the bucket list. <laughs> absolutely. I've, I've wanted to write something with mind control parasites for a very long time. And now I have my, my dad is a molecular biologist and he, he is always, uh, he, he was the kind of person that like when I was a kid, you don't want to watch science fiction movies with because he'd sit there going, that's not how that would work. That's not how that would work. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. But he read this and he, uh, he, he likes the science and he's, he was, <laughs> He sends me reviews of my own books that he finds online, and he's like, "They didn't, they didn't mention how good the science is in this book. They should have mentioned how good the science is." So I'm here to tell everyone, my dad says the science is good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm bad at, 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 at telling synopses of my own books, as you can probably tell. Um, it's a, uh, it's a survival story in space with a, a snarky, shape shifting nanobot array and portal-based space travel and creepy mind control parasites and it's science fiction-y and it's a little bit scary um and it's a little bit funny i'm told which is good because i never thought that i could really write humor but apparently uh apparently i did and that's nice um and i just had a lot of fun writing it and i i hope it's fun to read I uh, won't mention the author's name because uh, they'd, they'd be mortified if I did. Um, but I uh, reviewed quite a few books over the years at middlegradeninja.com, available exclusively now, uh, esteemed audience. And uh, I had written a very positive review of this author's book. Uh, and then her father emailed me and said, oh, <laughs> but here are some additional positive qualities you missed. And I saved that email. It's one of my favorite uh, things I've ever received. So kudos to that guy. That's delightful. <laughs> I mean, maybe write the email, think about it, then don't send it next time, but still. Yeah, the uh, intentions are good, though. That's honestly... You can't that, that, somebody when you see them just overflowing with pride for their child. But yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask um, a bunch of questions about the, the book and the science. Sure. Um, let's start with anxiety, because I like this description just on page 10 if I may read part of your own book to you. Sure. Uh, but since when did that stop her planning something out way, way, way in advance? It was how she kept her mind calm, her thoughts in order. Not only that, but it was fun. And of course, um, when we meet Jillian, not, not a spoiler early on, yeah. she's got a very distinct plan about how many years it's gonna be before she gets to space, the exact steps she has to take. So this, uh, when I read that, I wondered, is that aspirational for you? Or how, is that now that I'm hearing, maybe it's, a, it's about your son. Does your son do this, um, this planning out in advance to manage anxiety? He does. And I did when I was a kid and I still do it now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating how, how different media depiction of anxiety in kids is from actual anxiety in kids. Because like one thing that my son will do is he will ask the same questions over and over and over. And it's not that he's not listening. And some people think that oh, he's not listening, he's not paying attention. It's not that, it's that he wants to know the exact second something changes. Like he wants to know what's going to happen in order. And anytime there's a deviation from that, like he wants to be apprised of it. He wants to know how to prepare for it. And like, I'm, I'm the same way. And I think that translates really well to a survival story or even like before we even get to the survival story part of this, like how she does plan things out and how she does have this whole scheme like that she's trying to set in motion. And she knows like she's 11, but she knows that it's probably going to take her a couple of years to really like bring this plan to fruition. And she's totally fine with that. And that's exactly how it was as a kid. And it's how I am now. Um, 
And I, I, I like being able to, to depict a kid like that who has that kind of, that kind of long game mentality and, and is willing to follow through. Uh, and then, of course, when things sneak up on her in this book, she realizes, like, hey, actually, this is things are going way too fast. I'm not ready. This is not in keeping with my plan. And so she has a bit of a a bit of a crisis there where she's she's like, I, I don't know if I'm ready for this because, you know, she wants to she wants to do the thing, but she wants to, you know, meet the thing on a, a battlefield of her own choosing, you know, on her own terms and do it that way. And then things get sprung on her and. That kind of throws her for a loop and that's very much my kid and it's it's very much me um yeah so would you as a parent of a child with anxiety if you had access to a space portal say surprise we're going to space <laughs> <laughs> you know what i the thing is with at least the way anxiety manifests in my son he sometimes needs to be moved out of his comfort zone like he's not he's very much like if he doesn't do the scary thing he regrets not doing the scary thing and if he does do the scary thing he's really proud of himself afterward for having done the scary thing um but he does need a bit of a nudge and when jillian's parents tell her like, hey we're going to go to space they give her the choice they're like you know we're we thought this would be a fun surprise for you. We totally understand if you're freaking out right now, you don't have to go. Like the initial plan was she was gonna go and stay with her aunt and there's like, we're, we can call her, she could be here in 15 minutes. You do not have to come. They're not like, you know, bodily bundling her into a spaceship. They're, they're giving her the choice. Um, I would give my kid the choice, um, but I might also surprise him with it because like, and when they surprise her with it, like, they know she has anxiety, but also their intentions are very good. They know that she's wanted to go to space with them for years. And, you know, on face value, like, she even, she even says to herself, like, she doesn't, she doesn't know why she can't, like, why her brain doesn't just let her like this. Like, why her brain gets in the way and makes her question, like, whether she should be doing this or whether it's something she'll enjoy or whether it's too dangerous. And, uh... That's that's very much my son coming through. If if he gets kind of bodily nudged out of his comfort zone, he always regrets or doesn't. He always regrets not not moving outside of his comfort zone. He always is glad in hindsight when he is moved out of his comfort zone. And that's what her parents were doing there. It was with the best of intentions. Ah, if things had gone as planned, it would have been a lovely day. <laughs> it it would have. It would have had space picnics and like do a campfire in space with some space s'mores and do everything she wanted to do. But instead, she got to have an adventure. And, you know, if it. It was scary, but, you know, that's that's what makes it an adventure is things didn't go as planned. Uh, we were just going to have a nice calm picnic at Jurassic Park and, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong, you know? So who uh, who is the ideal reader for this story? Was there was, did you write with somebody specific in mind or a specific type of of reader that you are hoping this will find its way to? I really I I wrote it for really all the kids. Like my my kid is so much like me at that age, and so I really wrote it I guess for all the other kids who are like us who have these big plans of adventures they want to go on, but like also in a way kind of timid in the actual choosing to go on the adventures. Like when I was a kid, I I had all these plans of things I wanted to do, but like, if I'm honest with myself, I was the kid who stayed in my room all day and read books. You know, I wasn't going out and having adventures. I was reading about other people having adventures. And so it's, uh, and I, I, would, I would make plans for adventures I wanted to go on. I would have lists of the things I would bring with me. Um, I was a weirdo, you know, um, and I still am, and that's okay. And I, I wrote it for the other weirdos, I guess, the weirdos of the younger generation who, who want to go off and, and have adventures and make lists of all the things they're going to bring with them and, you know, maybe aren't entirely sure what they're getting into and maybe sometimes bite off a little more than they can chew. And that's part of an adventure, too. I have just as as we're recording this, 
um, purchased a used uh, virtual reality for a PlayStation. So I'm like marveling at technology that came out in 2016, 2018. I'm way behind. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's how I'm an adventure from now on. I did a video of, of swimming with great white sharks and they swim right up to. So, oh, that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. There was no need for me to get into a cage. With <laughs> In the actual, no, if somebody puts together a video of climbing Kilimanjaro, I will watch the heck out of it, I will enjoy it. I will, oh, I feel like I'm there and I yeah. didn't hyperthermia, fine. <laughs> no frozen fingers, this is great. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I think I think that's uh, the same one of the one of the things that books have always uh, provided me with is oh I can read about really brave people doing really brave mm -hmm. things that I would never do because it would I, I can't foresee it going necessarily that well for me I would definitely be in far more trouble than the character was in oh yeah for sure maybe that's a slogan for librarians if you're listening you you can have that books <laughs> virtual reality of the mind there you go <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Um, in the uh, description, just a, a fun thing. I saw that Spaceman Spiff uh, is, is, is mentioned. <laughs> Are you a Calvin and Hobbes fan, or is that a happy coincidence? No, it is not a happy coincidence. I am. I, I've read those when they were still coming out in the paper. I have all the, the books. I was obsessed with those when I was, I don't know, eight, ten years old. Those were great. Uh, they, again, not a conscience, conscious influence. Um, for this, but definitely like hit me at a very formative time. And I was, I was, I was a very, like a kid who kind of lived in my own head a lot of the time. And so I, I could relate to Calvin quite a bit and, you know, I still can. Um, yeah, th those were fantastic. Uh, and then as far as the science, obviously there's, um, I, I, I wrote a, a, a science fiction trilogy, uh, middle grade, uh, and, and toward the end, I started to get nervous because like the technology is catching up to what mm -hmm. was speculation a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and now I can't even write flying saucer books because they're going to disclose all the <laughs> truth about UFOs and then I'm done. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have lives about the, the aliens anymore. Um, do you, uh, you're obviously, you're, 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 you're pretty far out. Uh, you've got uh, Sabrina, which I felt like was was nanobots, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Yep, she, yep she's nanobots. And uh, you've got Sabrina, you've got portals. Do you worry about, um, as a science fiction writer, do you worry about the incredible, miraculous time that we're living in? That it's wonderful to live in, terrible to try to be writing mm -hmm. speculative science fiction that's a few years out in? Well, I mean, I'm just coming off of having uh, my book that just came out is it takes place about the same time as, as Jillian, actually just uh, several years later, I guess, in the in the same timeline. And it's about how like the a lot of the reality that we're living in now, like the bad parts, like, you know, the climate change stuff and the, the corporate consolidation has like moved forward 100 years in the future to where it's literally like two corporations that own everything and they're all and it's at, at literal civil war. And there's water rationing and electricity rationing and all kinds of all kinds of fun stuff. So I think for me it's it's maybe even the opposite. It's that like I can see I, I guess I'm pessimistic about it and that I see like all of the the bad things that are just going to get worse and I have a hard time like focusing on the cool stuff that that might might come about because just, just the the with collapse of everything right now that's happening. But that's it's really bleak. But yeah, it would be very cool if we had a uh, portal portal based travel and uh intelligent nanobots and stuff. So I don't worry about it. I think it would be I think it would be cool. Um and I have like kind of a, a weird fiction background. So Sabrina if Sabrina if I owe the idea of Sabrina to anything, it's not even like science fiction or even reality. It's probably like Jake the dog from Adventure Time who could like <laughs> turn it to all different shapes. Like Sabrina kind of takes it a step further in that she actually can like perform different functions. Um, but the the shape shifting into anything, um, there, there's almost absolutely, no, there's absolutely definitely some some Jake the dog in, in Sabrina. Um, yeah, 
I don't know. I like, I like taking influences from everywhere. And if some of these things come to pass, cool. Um, but in the meantime, like, I, I think, I think there's a while before, before some of this, this reality catches up with us and, you know, it's going to be like my, my kid's going to grow up and his generation is going to be reading stuff that like other science fiction writers and myself have been writing now and they're going to be like, oh, this aged terribly. This stuff all, you know, happened. This is all old, old school stuff now. It's like, it's retro. And there's stuff that I can do about that. So I just have fun with it while I can. Fair enough. Um, I always thought the the Foundation uh, trilogy, Asimov, I always thought that was the most optimistic science fiction writer book, this idea of a society or of a man, I believe, can predict exactly what's going to happen hundreds of years to a T. Like, oh, he wanted to be that person. And I understand. That's, I don't think that's possible, but I, I like the dream of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um, uh, with with uh, the science, because you want to pass your father's smell test, you want the reviewers <laughs> to say that this is this is solid science. How do you go about doing your research on nanobots on on, on making a plausible portal? And how how plausible do you feel some of this stuff is? Well, with the technology we have now, I mean, really, none of it's plausible. The only thing that I think really is is the the parasite that, that they encounter there. And I did a lot. I didn't really do research into portals and nanobots, like my, my understanding of those things. I've read some stuff just in passing, but not really like as research, just as in kind of like these are cool articles that I've read over the years. And uh, just like some like incipient technologies in, in those ways, like obviously nanobots are a, a ways off of of Sabrina, but the parasite um, is very firmly based in parasites that we have here on Earth. Like there are some very, 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 very strange parasites that manipulate their host's behavior in ways that benefit the parasite to the to the destruction of the host. And there are like there are so elaborate the way that that evolution has designed these these parasites to, to kind of co-evolve along with with their hosts. And I read a number of books about those. I read um, Parasite Rex by Carl Zimmer, which uh, that was probably the first one I read. And This Is Your Brain on Parasites by Kathleen McAuliffe and um, Light of the Living Dead, which is a fantastic, fantastic title for a, a book of essays about mind control parasites. That's by Matt Simon. Those were absolutely indispensable research for me with with these with this book because i wanted my my parasite to have a viable life cycle that made sense like the other stuff like the you know portal based space travel is very hand wavy it kind of has to be by definition i didn't want to even try in a kid's book to like try to explain like try to give them some kind of hard science explanation for like how a portal would work or you know how the nanobots work it was just part of the world that that Jillian lives in, and it's explained to her in a way that she can understand um, to give her kind of a working definition of how these things work. But the the parasite, she has to figure out for the, the purposes of the plot, like what it's doing and like what it might do to her and how to keep it from doing that. And so that was the part that I really extensively researched. And it was a lot of fun because it is, it is fascinating in a, in a very kind of squicky body horror kind of way um, what parasites are doing to, to insects and, and other animals here on Earth right now. It's just, it's just fascinating. Is there a wasp that lands in the brain? You know what? I'm, I'm going to have to remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a the emerald jewel wasp i think and it, it like lobotomizes cockroaches and it it kind of like takes off their antennae and then drives them into a burrow and then lays eggs in it and so the the cockroach just is totally chill this entire time doesn't try to get away doesn't do anything because the the, the wasp has just very delicately lobotomized it and made it so it can't really do anything about it and there's a there's a fungus that preys on ants that basically like makes the ant seem entirely normal because if the ant doesn't seem normal, the colony will be onto it and kick it out. Um, 
up into the ant seems entirely normal while this fungus is just completely invading its entire body and like enmeshing in its muscles and just literally just driving this ant around. And then when the fungus is ready to fruit, it will take the ant and tell the ant, okay, now go up this stalk of grass and go up to a very specific height at a very specific time of day, because this is the optimal place and temperature and humidity level for when the fruiting body of this mushroom comes out of the ant's head and the spores will rain down on the other ants that are marching along below. And it's just like, it's so cool. <laughs> Do you, uh, is that a fear of yours? That, that there will be a parasite eventually like that for us? No, it's like, not really. Um, I mean, there there have been a couple of books, uh, novels recently-ish that have to do with uh, a parasite infection um, that attacks humans. There was one that was called The Fireman by Joe Hill, I think. and. Uh, the girl with all the gifts, I think, was a fungal infection. I think. That so one. it's just, yeah. I read that one. I've read. This yeah, one. yeah. So it's uh, it's it's interesting to see that it's it's getting it's getting some play in in fiction because it's just like it's low hanging fruit. It is just so, so much like interesting stuff there that you could work with, and there's all different like all different things you could have a parasite do to people. It's just like. I don't know. It's 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 really interesting, and I don't think very many people are writing about it yet, but they should be, so I can read their books because I find it fascinating. That's the uh, the Last of Us universe, which of course is going to be a TV show, even though the game already nailed it. Mm -hmm. You know, I still haven't played that. I've been like so lax at playing video games for the past few years. Like I've been playing some indie games, but I haven't played anything big, even though there's all kinds of things that keep getting recommended to me over and over again. That's been recommended to me a lot. And I just, I have not gotten around to it, but I should. Well, I know that uh, you, you've written about uh, gaming uh, mm -hmm. with your newest novel, um, and you're wearing a gaming headset as we talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I know you have a, a video out. game past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've been a gamer all my life, really. Um, like, going way back to when I used to have to pretend to be sick so I could stay home from school because it was the only time that I didn't have to, like, share the Super Nintendo with my brother. Because <laughs> otherwise, like, our time was just, like, strictly regimented because there was one TV and there was one console. Actually, no, rotating consoles, but one TV that we had to share. And, uh, yeah. I like video games. I, I and I, I think they have a lot of a lot of a lot of merit in a lot of ways. Like that was another thing about my 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 son being a reluctant reader. One thing that got him like really improved his reading fluency is video games. And the same thing was true with my brother, as far as I can recall. Like I remember him complaining that he couldn't read quickly. And then, like, we played a lot of JRPGs, and there'd be a lot of, like, you know, scrolling dialogue boxes. And he had to learn to read fast enough that when we would take turns playing them, and I was older than him and could read faster, so I would, like, click through the dialogue boxes faster than he could read them. So he had to get to where he would read faster because I was, um, I'm not supposed to curse on, on this. I was being a jerk and not slowing down for him. Um, so he had to, you know, get on the get on the level. And it's really a lot of parents and a lot of teachers, I think, um, look at video games and comics as kind of like lesser in terms of you know, what kids could be reading or should be reading with their time. And I, I don't see it that way at all. Um, I'm going on a tangent now, but I don't know. I feel strongly about this. Tangent away. There's, yeah, there's just there's. There's so many things that that kids can learn from video games, and reading is the is the least of them. But it's just, I think if kids are going to to read and to read widely and to read well, they have to be allowed to read what interests them. And maybe that's not chapter books, and maybe it's not you know whatever the the teacher or the state wants them to read. Maybe maybe it's comics or maybe it's video games or maybe it's just, you know, texting with a friend. But it's like it's all reading. 
And I don't know, I think having like, it was very strange to me, like, because I was a voracious compulsive reader. And I never expected that my kid would end up being a reluctant reader. And so that was that was kind of jarring for me for a while because I was like, what, what do you mean you don't want to read for fun? Like, who doesn't want to read for fun? And so I really had to spend a lot of time trying to figure out and a lot of trial and error. Like we, we moved to a place that was within like a block of a library so that I could just, well, first of all, get books for me. but also just be very, very experimental in like the things that I threw at him to try to figure out what he enjoyed reading because the last thing I wanted was for reading to be a chore for him. And that was one of the reasons I pulled him out of school is he, I promised him that I would homeschool him as soon as he stopped liking public school. He loved public school up until he was in fifth grade and they started doing like middle school preparatory work. And that involved a lot of, uh, you know, reading stuff that none of them enjoyed because it was what the state wanted them to be reading or whatever. And it just, it, he was, I had just gotten him to a place where he was starting to enjoy reading and that just completely destroyed it for him. They actually, the, one of the last straws for me was that they were reading in class what was then his favorite book, Hatchet by Gary Paulson. And rather than just reading it and enjoying it, they were kind of like reading it sentence by sentence and just vivisecting this book for like literary devices and this and that and like taking all of the joy, just like sucking the joy out of this book. And like, it's an adventure story. It's an intense story about a kid who has to like survive on his own and it's extremely evocative and it's very immersive and they're like literally breaking it down sentence by sentence and like looking for like, literary devices and I was like I just and it made him start to hate his favorite book and that was just like I was mad um and so then we we spent a long time figuring out what he wanted to read and uh that turned out to be to start with a lot of comics a lot of video games and now he's reading chapter books on his own by choice uh but that was a huge step for him which is, you know, a lot of why I wanted to to write something that would hopefully appeal to other reluctant readers too. But it has a lot of, really all my stuff has a lot of, of influence from uh, video games, comics, action movies, things like that. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully they will be interesting to read. That was a long tangent. Our all-time favorite uh, video games, like obviously excluding The Last of Us, which I haven't gotten to yet. No, we'll I haven't gotten to it yet list when you get there oh my all-time favorite video games oh man i don't even know i can, one of my most formative video games when i was about 10 years old was earthbound that was a very weird game i loved that game that was a, a very very quirky jrpg um it was the first rpg i ever played and i was it, it just blew my mind like you're you're playing through a story and like you have to make decisions for the character and dialogue and everything and I was just like this is amazing it's like I'm playing a book but this was a very quirky game like it was marketed with scratch and sniff materials it was it was <laughs> it had a it, it had a keychain that looked like a slice of pizza and it said earthbound on the back and it was a scratch and sniff slice of pizza and there were uh we used to get this oh, I forget what it's called it was some video game magazine my brother and I and it had like this like pull out advertisement coupon insert thing for earthbound and it had uh it had scratch and sniff pictures of like the different bosses you fight and like each one of them had a smell there was like a slime guy and there was like a whatever it was a very quirky game and that was very much in the spirit of the actual game it was weird but i i loved it um not my favorite game but my most formative game certainly um just probably because it was it it it, it expanded my horizons in a way. I love RPGs. RPGs are great. But lately, all I've been able to really play are uh, indie games. And there have been a couple that have just been like really, really good. There was one that's on, I played it on Steam. I don't know where else it is. It's called The Return of the Obra Dinn. And it is this very, very indie game. Um, and I almost couldn't play it because it almost gave me a migraine just visually. I, I get visual migraines. And this was the only game that I ever like played through a migraine aura to play this game because I loved it so much. It's like 
this year it's in 1700s, I think, London. I played this a few years ago and I'm, I'm hazy on the details, but this ship, which was presumed missing, the Oberdin, returns to port and everybody's like, what's this ship doing here? And the ship belongs to the East India Company and you, the character, are an insurance claims adjuster for the East India Company. And so your job is to get on the ship, try to figure out how everybody died, like who who is owed money to, like what what happened here? And so you get on there and you have this magic pocket watch, which it basically, if you are near a corpse it, and you activate this pocket watch, it will show you like the last few seconds of this person's life. And so you get on the ship and there's literally like a corpse and you have to go back from that and like just go deeper and deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole of like where all the other people were through time on this ship you have a manifest and the whole idea is you have to map you have a photo and a manifest a photo of the whole crew and the passengers and you have to write down like match the name to the person what they look like and also how they died and that's the entire game but at the same time it is a master class in non-linear storytelling and it was just i banged out that whole game and like 36 hours because I just could not stop playing it and I like it's borderline migraine the entire time and I just I, it was it was very compelling like I, I want to have my memory wiped so I can replay that game it's it's just really good it has no replay value because it's just a mystery but uh oh it was fun I just recently played uh Disco Elysium which people had been recommending to me for like a billion years and it's um it was again very very good it's like a point and click uh you're going through and you're you're it's not really a point and click but it's 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 very low key um and you're going through this town and you're trying to solve a, a murder mystery and um but the way that it's done is this just extremely i'm gonna say quirky again i guess i like quirky games this is very quirky it's basically like all of your stats, so most of your stats that you can level up are like mental attributes and they will inform your choices. So like you, you are like this alcoholic cop and you have amnesia, you have no idea, like you woke up there and you're like, what am I doing here? You're not sure if you were just like so drunk that you don't remember where you were, what you were doing there. And you have to be told like, look, you're here trying to solve this crime. This is your job. Um, but in the course of like, leveling up these different attributes or internalizing these different thoughts that come to you out of nowhere, you might have yourself convinced that, you know, you're a washed up rock star. And so then that will start informing your dialogue options and your decision making. And I don't even know like to what extent, if I went back and replayed it, I don't, I don't know how much like the choice trees actually, like the branching of the choice trees actually inform how the game ends. But there is just there is so much cool stuff thrown in there and it's just, it's so different and it's just so, it's so authentically itself and so different from anything else. And I think that's what I tend to appreciate most in pretty much all media is just when something is so, so unapologetically itself that I don't even care if it's flawed, it's ambitious and it's different. And I don't know, I have a lot of respect for that. I, I really enjoy that game, but I don't have a favorite I think because I play all different kinds of games. Like I had, I got this because I was playing, who was I playing with this lately? Or when I uh, bought this, it. Those listening is the, is the gaming headset? Yeah, the gaming headset. Um, I was playing like Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. It's like a battle royale game. I was playing it with, uh, with a couple of people. I play a lot of just like different, different things. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of miss it. I haven't I haven't had much time to play stuff lately. But I have I have eclectic taste in video games and in books and in pretty much everything, honestly. Which is what makes it interesting to like just kind of draw influences from things because I just kind of cram everything into my head and see what I can make books out of. Well, I have you, and I'm always curious about. I talk to so many authors who, who you, you talk to one author, you talk to an author, everybody's got their own way of doing mm -hmm. things. But I never quite understand, I don't understand teachers that don't see the value in comics or in video games. I'm 100% with you there. But I 
definitely don't. I, I've, I've had enough authors say it to me that read, only read, never watch television, never play video games. So mm -hmm. why would you cut yourself off from such a huge mm -hmm. part of the culture? I don't know. that. I, I mean, obviously, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But for me, like, when I get asked about my influences as a writer, it's as many books as I've read, and I've read a lot of books like for a long time, but my my strongest influences are visual media. It's it's movies, like big dumb action movies, like so many big dumb action movies. What are your favorite Comics, big dumb action movies? My favorite big dumb action movies. Oh man. I'm a big fan of well, I'm a big fan of uh of of things in general that that have like for instance, okay. So Pacific Rim is one of my favorites. And again, it's not like, it's not a perfect movie. I don't care. It's, it's fun. It is what it is. It's itself. It's, uh, and I really, really loved how it had, it centered like a strong relationship between a male and female main character. And like at the very end of the movie, like everybody's expecting them to kiss and they don't kiss. And it's just, it's great. It's so refreshing because like they have this very, intimate relationship they're like they they pilot a mech together they are like you know mentally bonded to pilot mechs and save the world but they 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 very could very easily could have gone with the like okay so they're going to kiss at the end but they don't because like being mentally bonded to pilot a mech and save the world kind of implies that you have a strong relationship without being like okay here's the the visual shorthand of they're going to kiss i thought that was a very refreshing um but yeah, I like Pacific Rim a lot. I like uh, I like uh, Fury Road a lot. Um, Another platonic it, relationship between them. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's that's like that's my jam. I'm I'm very much into to platonic relationships in fiction. Um, I grew up uh, watching my my dad uh, around the same time that he was giving me science fiction to read. He was also trying to talk my mom into letting him show me and my brother um, action movies that were like more violent than we were used to. So like we saw the the alien movies, we saw the predator movies. Um, those were extremely formative for me. How old are you uh, watching these? How old was I, sorry, when I saw those? Uh -huh. I was like 12-ish, 10-ish. My brother probably was 10, I was 12, probably around there. Um, and then like, we got cocky. We were like, oh, we've seen all these things. We're going to go and see, you know, basically we went to, we wanted to go see a movie one time and, uh, we're looking at the, the newspaper, which dates this, or it was, it was listing the, the movies that were playing. And we saw that there was a movie called Event Horizon listed. And we were like, oh, that looks like it's going to be a space movie. We like space movies. And we went there and it scared the ever living heck out of us. Um, <laughs> we were not ready. Technically speaking, there is some space in it. <laughs> there is some space in it. But <laughs> we were like, oh, it's going to be like aliens. Or it's going to be like, it was not. It was not. I, we, I, I don't think either of us slept for a week after watching that movie. That movie terrified us. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I like action movies. I like movies with like, you know, big fight scenes and like cool choreography and, you know, I don't know. I like fight choreography is just so much fun to watch. And I try to, I try to write action scenes in a way that reminds me of how they would be depicted in a movie. And one of the things, like one of the nice things that people pretty consistently say about my books to me is that they love my action scenes. And if that's true, like if people like my action scenes, I can say definitively that it's because of movies and it's because of video games and it's because of comics and it's not because of books. Like that's the I, I love books, obviously, but they have not been like my strongest influences stylistically or thematically in pretty much anything that I've written. Even if that were true, wouldn't your reader be thinking of action scenes from movies that they'd seen when they're in their, uh, your yeah. your written material? Yeah, but like it's it's it just comes back to the thing where some people say like, oh, you know, books are the only fiction that's you know worth. I don't know whatever that you know 
movies and TV and video games and comics are like low art and books are high art and that kids should only read books and they shouldn't watch movies or do like it's all stories like why I don't I don't understand why why you would like some of the some of the coolest stories and like the most interesting and like boundary pushing stories are in movies or they're in you know tv now there's great things being done in tv now or video games and just to 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 try to erase all of that from like what's what's valid fictional media it's just it's a very strange mindset to me i don't know uh, but it's also strange to me that if you're an author but, or even just a, a reader, part of what you want is to have the experience of getting to intimately know another character and have experiences that you're not going to be able to have in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. good news, buddy. Put on a virtual reality helmet. Mm -hmm. You can have an incredible yep. version of that as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, as authors with books available, we, we, we strongly insist that books are the strongest of all mediums <laughs> that can be read first. But <laughs> no books are great. I love obviously I love books. Check out some of these games. <laughs> yeah. So um I had uh, a bunch of questions for you. I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about your agent, and that is Kate McKean mm -hmm. and is it Morheim uh, Literary mm -hmm. Agency? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did you get uh, hooked up to be represented by her? That's actually uh, backwards from how most people do, weirdly. Like, I, I had written uh, my YA debut, Archivist Wasp, and I was, I didn't have an agent, and I was shopping it around trying to find an agent. And uh, it was getting rejected a lot. And it was getting rejected mostly for the same reason over and over again, which was that it has a female and male main characters and that they it basically is like an enemies to best friends situation rather than like there's never any romantic interest there's never any any romance in that book and I had agents telling me essentially that if I did like a revise and resubmit adding in a romance or maybe even a love triangle you know they would be able to easily see their way to, to representing it, but as it was, they just weren't going to be able to do it because it was just teens wouldn't find anything to relate to without a romance, which that's when I got angry um, because obviously teens will find all kinds of things to relate to without romance. I mean, even if they're not asexual or aromantic teens, they still are going to value the friendships in their lives and want to see friendships represented in fiction i would imagine and so it's well, they, a, might. they were able to read stories in which that was valued rather than everything exactly was and so i even though i had no agent and i had no prospects for an agent no prospects for publication i had to stick to my guns with that and i was like i will i will make all kinds of changes to my book because you know obviously that's going to happen in edits and a lot of publishing is compromised but i am not going to budge on that that one thing i'm not going to add romance into this book because it was a book about friendship it was a book about strong platonic relationships and i specifically wrote it that way because it was so hard for me growing up to find books or even movies or really anything that depicted strong platonic relationships between characters of different genders like you'd find strong friendships between women or like you can watch war movies and see like strong relationships between men or like sports movies but you don't typically see those outside of those genres. And if there is a relationship depicted between a male and female character, there's gonna be like, it's gonna turn into romance or it's gonna turn into at least sexual tension or it's gonna come up in the story, even if it doesn't need to. And so I did not budge on that. And I was prepared to like, okay, I'm gonna learn how to self-publish even though I would be terrible at it because I'm not good at marketing. Um, and I was at a reader con one year, which was my favorite con. Um, and I was at dinner with, uh, oh, who was I at dinner with? It was Ellen Kushner and Isabel Wilse. And I had read Isabel Wilse's books and I, I really liked them a lot. And I was like fangirling a little bit. And 
she was asking me what what my book was about that I was trying because it came up that I was trying to find an agent for this book and I was telling her about it and she uh she was like asked to read it I was like well you, you want to read my book of course please do and so I sent it to her and it turns out she really liked it and um she basically told um, Gavin Grant and Kelly Link at Small Beer Press about it, and I got an email from them saying that they would love to publish my book. And I was like, "What?" Because I've always, I've always loved their books. Like they're, they're fantastic. They put out all kinds of great stuff. So well past and, personalized rejections at this point, they're writing you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, I, I, that was that was out of the blue, and they are so on the level, uh, Gavin and Kelly, that they. They told me like it would benefit me if I could get an agent so that I could be sure that, you know, I thought the contract was as fair to me as possible. And I was like, okay, but you know, that didn't really work out before. Um you had and a then, bad experience with the literary agent previous? Sorry? Is that you had a bad experience with a literary agent previous? Just the just the rejections that I was getting before about how teens would find nothing to relate to in a book that didn't have romance, a YA book. Um, contract I, already. I mean, that has to make age and shopping a little bit easier, right? Yeah, and I hadn't I hadn't actually um, queried Kate before because I think she had been closed to submissions at the time. Someone had recommended her to me, but she was closed, and um, I didn't know at the time that you could like ask people like if you know someone who is a client of an agent, you can ask them like, hey, can you put in a good word for me? And like, they'll, they might look at your your book, even though they, they say that they're closed. So I didn't know anything at the time. And so I waited for, by that time she had been, uh, she was open to queries and I hadn't asked her already. So I ran this by her and uh, um, we ended up thinking that we were a good match. And so, yeah, she's been my agent ever since. So can, to go back to one of the agents that passed with your kind <laughs> didn't have that that pretty woman moment where you go back <laughs> or you work on commission, right? <laughs> yeah, no, well, I, I relevant just, to a great reference I've made. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yes, I mean, she says yes. And then at what point do you get to, to where uh, you're consulting her with your story ideas? Because it sounds like she's relatively involved with Jillian, if not other books, right? Yeah, um, yeah, she's she's very hands-on, and I, I that's one of the things I really love about her. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, she she did like first pass edits on on pretty much everything I've I've sent through her. Um, the thing with Jillian and um, Take Your Kid to Work Day was the I think the one thing that I I was like super stumped, and I came I I had I had a different thing in my in my query my kind of like synopsis pitch for this book and it, it wasn't as like it didn't make as much sense as just hey it's take your kids to work day they're taking their kids to work um so that was that was hugely helpful but yeah she's very hands-on and she's she's amazing and i uh she's she's been great um but yeah i i kind of ran into her in a very backward sort of way and people when people ask me how did i got my agent because I, I have a number of friends who are having trouble finding agents. And I'm like, I'll tell you, but it's kind of non-standard. Um, yeah, that's not the kind of story that inspires hope, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that kills me is that I understand why those agents were saying, you know, this book is unsellable because it's not romance, because like that's what people are conditioned to expect, especially in YA. And I think it's kind of insulting to teens that like in middle grade, there are so many amazing friendships between kids of all genders and there's never any talk of romance and like the friendships are deep and beautiful and valid and depicted as valid. And then it's like we're telling kids that as soon as they you know graduate from middle grade to YA, then those friendships should be worth less to them. And that, you know, we start giving them stories about how like there'll be a love triangle and the person who didn't get picked still gets to be just friends with the protagonist. And it's like, I think it's damaging. And I think it probably informs a lot of like bad expectations that people have for their relationships in real life, that they will go into them potentially thinking that, you know, 
if all goes well, maybe this won't be just a friendship. Like friendships are devalued in media aimed at people who are older than like 10 or 12. And that continues through, you know, books aimed at adults or movies aimed at adults. Like there's almost always going to be a romantic interest or sexual tension or whatever. And you know, and like friendships are important too. And they should get they should get page time and they should get screen time. And so I don't blame the agents for saying, you know, hey, you need to write a romance into this or I can't sell it. It's just it's industry wide and it's not even just, you know, the book publishing industry. It's it's cultural. It's just this this devaluation and erasure of friendships and platonic relationships. And I wonder sometimes if friendships and platonic relationships were given more value in our fictional media, like would that potentially make concepts like, you know, being friend zoned uh, less prevalent because people wouldn't expect that like if if a relationship is going well, then, you know, there's the friendship, which is a stepping stone to like a romantic relationship. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't like there's no reason why it should necessarily be like people in real life value their friendships with people of all genders. And I don't see why that should be such a hard sell in fiction. You know, it does seem like uh, we would probably benefit tremendously as a society if we were to put more value uh, into that. Um, I mean, the, I, I know from personal experience, when I finally uh, found my wife uh, and said, okay, this is the person I'm going to be with forever, that made uh, making friendships uh, much easier from that point on because it was always off the table. Like, we don't even have to investigate that possibility because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fully committed. We can right. just be friends. Mm -hmm. And not just. How, how many right. wonderful friends do I have in my life? Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a real problem. And I mean, at least subconsciously, like we culturally draw so much from stories, just as, as humans, we draw so much from stories and we use them to inform real life choices. And it's it's about how like, it's just like with anything else that needs more representation. It's if we can see it depicted that we know how to recognize it and appreciate its validity. So I write friendship books and I I will keep writing friendship books and with no romance for all ages. My YA books and my middle grade book and my adult book all are like that because I want to do whatever I can to just add a few more books to the pile of you know, books that do that so that other people who are looking for that kind of relationship to be depicted in in their books have another example of something that they can read where they can they can see themselves reflected. Well, you and I are in agreement. Now we just gotta get the rest of the world on board. Yeah. <laughs> Which thankfully they're listening to this podcast. It's 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 done. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, well, I always uh, want to make sure that I ask, because I ask everybody, uh, mm -hmm. have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? Well, I went to school in Pinebush, New York, which is one of the UFO capitals of the world. And I never saw a UFO there. And I felt very, very disappointed and let down by that, because apart from that, that school sucked. So I wanted at least a UFO <laughs> to temper my experience, and I was I was denied it. Um, one time when I was a kid, I saw something that I don't really know what it was. I mean, definitionally to me, it was a UFO because I didn't identify it and I couldn't, and I still don't know what it was. Um, but I didn't get a good look at it. It was it was at night, so it wasn't like a shape that I saw in the sky. It was more like a light that was doing a really weird thing. Um, it basically I was I was with my family and we were watching the stars, and 
we were like trying to point out constellations and stuff. And then there was this light that I thought was a shooting star. We all saw it. And at first we all thought it was a shooting star, except it was red. And it it streaked up across the sky, like, you know, several inches from like what we like several inches in our, our view. And, but it was red, um, which is unlike any shooting star I've ever seen. And it was huge. And we're like, wow, it's a huge shooting star. And it gets up to like, you know, a few inches up from where we saw it. And then it stops. And then it makes a 90 degree turn and it starts going beep, 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 just like, like not beeping, but like blinking, going off to the right. And I'm like, I have no idea what that thing was. Um, and we all saw it. And uh, like, I, I, I certainly don't disbelieve that, that UFOs would exist. Like, I think it's, I think it's much more likely that they exist than that they don't. Um, and have I ever seen a ghost? I have never seen a ghost. Um, I wrote like there are ghosts in some of my books, but they're like very non-standard ghost stories. The closest that I think that I come personally to, you know, like have I seen a ghost, is a secondhand kind of story. My mom, when I was about eight or nine years old, uh, opened this this uh, confinement shop, and it was in this building where above it was an apartment. And there was like the people, there was like this very swift succession of people who would like rent the above apartment. And she, like, she didn't, she didn't own the building. So she, she wasn't in contact with them at all. Like they were just dealing with her same landlord. And those, like they would, weird things would happen where like my mom would be at the at the at her shop late at night and she'd know that like the people upstairs were gone because they told her they were going to like go on vacation or whatever and she would hear like footsteps going back and forth across like up there and she had no idea what that was and often like these people would come back from wherever and then they would just move out like immediately like with like their dishes still on the table they were just like gone and so we always thought as kids like oh it must be that it's haunted but you know i have no idea like maybe maybe they just all got in trouble with them like, i don't i don't know i have no idea like it was weird it was like a movie like where they just like leave their dishes on the table and just scram like their clothes in the closet and just leave and just never come back out of nowhere like not near when their lease was up not near when like, their rent was due just gone and that coupled with the like, you know, weird footsteps and sounds up there when there was nobody supposed to be there. Like as kids, we always thought that was the ghost, but I don't remember much of that anymore. So I don't know. I'd like to see a ghost. I don't know. I think I think it would be interesting, but I never have. And uh, same thing with the UFO. Like that, that one thing. I have, I have no idea what that thing was. The the shooting star blinky blinky thing. But uh, yeah, I'd like to. I'd, I'd I'd like proof that there's like interesting things out there that we don't understand. I mean, obviously there's interesting things out there that we don't understand, but more is always better. Are you uh, hopeful with the uh, government continuing to release documents? The CIA just dumped a bunch of their old documents. Are you hopeful that we're going to get some form of disclosure? Probably not all the answers, but something we can sink our teeth into. I think it'd be fascinating. I would I would definitely be be interested to to know the truth. It would be that'd be cool. Like, yeah, my brother and I have, have like for many, many years kind of like sent each other articles like this when they when they come out and so we're, we're both kind of waiting to see see what they come out with and, and whether, whether there's like any definitive answers that would be neat i could use the burst of optimism because after mm -hmm. going through the pandemic with dummies that won't wear a mask to save mm -hmm. their family, all right i'm done watching humanity give me some new creatures that are smarter Heck yeah <laughs> So um, you've got uh, two books coming out here at the, the end of a pandemic. You were ahead of the pandemic because you were already homeschooling. But mm -hmm. what does your writing life look like over the past few years? And what does it look like now? How many 
how much writing are you able to get done and when do you do it? <laughs> it's bleak. It's uh, I don't get very much done. Um, before the pandemic, I was getting more done because even when I was homeschooling, we'd go out and do things I had. He, he went to a, a wilderness skills class because he likes the outdoor survival stuff and he used to like go to my parents' house and everything. And so I'd have some time there. Um, but he's old enough now that he's, you know, he works on his own projects and stuff. He doesn't really need me to hang out with him all day. And so I, I do get some done. It's just, I'm also kind of on call like all the time because I'm, I'm kind of like the parent who's also like his buddy. And so he's constantly like talking to me and you know, like, Hey, what you doing? Check out what I'm doing. Hey, I just built this thing and check it out. You want to try it? Like, sure. And so it just destroys my train of thought when I'm trying to work, but I, I, I don't, I don't hold that against him. Like I, I knew what I was signing up for when I homeschooled him. So right now, just honestly, like whatever, whatever time I can get is, is good. And I'm grateful for it. Um, can you imagine getting to the end of your life, which is many, many, many years from now and you're on your deathbed and you think, I wish I'd spent less time with my child and written. Right, exactly. Time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I can, I can write whenever. Um, so that can, you know, that can wait until he's older and I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting bits done, but like, I'm the kind of person that if I get really into a project, I get obsessive and then like, I get cranky if I can't work on it. And so I like when he's around, I actively try not to get too deep in thought on a book because I don't want to be like unpleasant for him to be around. <laughs> so right now I'm just kind of like kicking around ideas for a few things. And, you know, now that I mean, he just got his second dose of his vaccine yesterday, so he'll hopefully be able to start going um, get back to my parents' house and, you know, go do various things and we'll get some time back. But, you know. When it's safe, because yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the number one important thing. Well, that's tremendous. Okay. Congratulations on the the second shot. That should open yeah. up all kinds of opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, I'm lucky enough that he's old enough for that. Cause, uh, yeah, he was uh, he was very afraid to go and do that. He, he is very needle phobic, but he he went and did it, and he was very proud of himself, and I'm proud of him too, because that was really hard for him. Well, hopefully everyone is listening. If you haven't been vaccinated, go get vaccinated. But you're, you've yes, been please. vaccinated. Honest, you like books. You like learning. <laughs> I'm not talking to folks that are hesitant. <laughs> well, my uh, last question is always some mm -hmm. variation of, and this has been just a delight. I always want to end while we're, while we're having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really appreciate you making the time and being such a tremendous guest. No, thank but my you. last question is always, um, if you could go back toward the start of your career, middle of your career, whenever it would be useful, and give yourself some crucial advice that would have made a difference for you and might make a difference for all the writers who are watching or listening to us now, what would you go back and say? Hmm. I think the most important thing is to always have fun with it. like. There are all kinds of steps in the writing and publishing processes that are you know, very frustrating and very demoralizing. Um, but like if what you're writing isn't fun, like you can you can tell when you're reading something, watching a movie or something, when you're like, you know, they had fun making this, you know? And if if you write things that are fun for you to write and that only you could write them in that way, then that will shine through to the people who read it. And it'll just, it, the fun that you had writing it will, will come through in the, in the reading. And, you know, don't try to write to the market. Don't try to write to like, what you think people are going to want to read. Like write, write the story that's trying to chew its way out through the side of your head. And, uh, and just see what happens. You are in love with parasites, right? The story that you just <laughs> <laughs> It's fantastic. I am what I am. <laughs> Where can a esteemed audience find you online, follow you on social media, all that good stuff? I'm really bad at social media. I am on Twitter, um, and my handle there is wirewalking. 
And um, I have a very old website, which is nicolefornerstace.com, and you can contact me through there. As always, esteemed audience, head to middlegreatninja.com. I have prepared thousands of fantastic interviews with editors, literary agents, authors, the back catalog of the show. Everything that is good in this world is available at middlegreatninja.com. While you're there, follow the link to download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. Then pay cash money for the other two books. You get the show for free. Go nuts. Uh, and as always, God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.